It's a great pleasure to introduce Eileen Reeves, even though you did your best to stall. It was inevitable that you'd be invited. Since I first heard about Eileen's work on Galileo when I was a zero-day assistant professor, she was an advanced graduate student at Stanford, there was no possibility that you were going to escape from giving a talk at this conference. Um, Eileen's work has been remarkable, not only for the books, which I highly recommend to you, um, about astronomy and art, painting, heavens and Galileo's glassworks and a forth, forthcoming work, which I've not read, obviously, on uh, the, the understanding of color and, and, and chromatic studies. It, all of her work in some ways touches on Galileo. And what's remarkable about it is that from the very beginning, she's, had a, she's, she's helped really, I think, revolutionize the study of the relationship of science and literature by going far beyond what was the norm back when she began her work, which was to think of uh, images of science and metaphors of science in literary works as the end of the inquiry. For her, that's just the beginning, and her studies have taken us deep into the understanding how the very formulation of literary structure and scientific reasoning of image and art uh, have been deeply connected. So it's with great pleasure. I welcome Ellie Reeves. Thank you. Let me begin with a small puzzle and then turn to a larger one. A mid 18th century inventory of one of the villas of the Salviati family listed, among other less interesting items, a telescope and a portrait of Galileo Galilei. The telescope in time was brought to Florence, but the portrait remains outside of the city in Villa Le Selve, where Galileo and his host Filippo Salviati conducted research on the sunspots in the summer of 1612. Now, how do I drive this thing? How do I make it go forward? Just right here? Oh, right here. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Um, ascribed to an unknown 17th century Italian artist, the portrait appears to represent the astronomer somewhere between Filippo Furini's image of about 1612 on the left and Eusta Sustermann's painting of 1636. Though much closer in age to Furini's sitter, the image bears a stronger formal resemblance to Sustermann's more celebrated work. The portrait seems to commemorate a particular moment, perhaps that of Galileo's sojourn in this very setting, for the celestial globe implies in the artist's focus on cancer that the season is between June 21st and July 22nd. Equipped with a compass, two books, and his telescope, Galileo seems intent on obscuring whatever it is he is reading or writing. It's an excellent icon of what interests me today, Galileo's research program in the summer of 1612, and the relationship of that agenda to a passage published two decades later in the third day of the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. At stake in the latter is Galileo's famous, or perhaps infamous, claim to have discovered the slight tilt of the solar axis years before and to have real, realized its usefulness as evidence for a Copernican world system at that point, but to have failed to see it into print until 1632. Most scholars have argued that Galileo reached these conclusions very late in the fall of 1631 when he encountered the meticulous data of his rival Christoph Scheiner's Rosa Ursina and that he retrofitted them to a Copernican model and quickly inserted the story of his epiphany in his dialogue, then already in press. A few have suggested, by contrast, that his acquaintance with the seasonal variations in the sunspot's apparent path was a long-standing, if underdeveloped one, and that the realization about the tilted solar axis, however tardy, was his own. For my part, I see no particular reason to choose between these depictions of brazen plagiarist and leisurely genius. Today, I'll be sketching a hypothesis that involves both. I'd like to take a look first at the passage from the dialogue. As the only direct quotation of Galileo in the entire text, and a very long one at that, it is at once the most important and the strangest moment of the work. Having offered a brief history of Galileo's solar study, that is, 
his precocious private discovery of the sunspots in Venice in the summer of 1610, his public display of them in Rome in the spring of 1611, his sustained observations and initial conflict with Shiner in 1612, and the publication of the three magisterial letters on the sunspots in 1613, Galileo's spokesman, Salviati, <laughs> recounted that the astronomer initially attributed any deviation from a path presumed parallel to the ecliptic to the spot's numerous and accidental changes. He also noted that once the letters were published and his rival Shiner thoroughly trashed, that Galileo focused on other matters, reverting to the sunspots only when prompted by queries from friends. Here the text takes a peculiar turn, in part because the dialogue becomes a sort of ventriloquism. And here's that famous text. This is Salviati speaking. A few years later, having discovered with me, while we were in my villa at Le Selve, a rather large, dense, and isolated sunspot, and encouraged by a stretch of bright and calm weather, we made at my request an observation of its entire transit. We notice its place very carefully every day when the sun was on the meridian. And realizing that the spot's trajectory was not exactly a straight line, but slightly curved, we decided to make other observations from time to time. This undertaking brought about a certain concept, an idea that suddenly struck my guest. And with these words, he shared it with me. Oh, Filippo, <laughs> it seems to me that a great road is opening up before us. That is, if the axis about which the sun turns does not stand perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic, but is somewhat inclined to it, as this curve glows his notion more clearly. Now the recitation goes on for a full page, with Salviati recounting from memory Galileo's explanation of the strange changes the sunspots would appear to go for a diligent terrestrial observer. Only twice a year would they follow the rectilinear path once invariably assigned to them. They normally describe slight arcs, curves tending towards convexity for one half of the year and concavity for the other. Sagredo interrupts Salviati's performance and his confession of perplexity allows the speaker to describe his own initial bewilderment to explain that Galileo had repurposed a simple sphere of some sort by way of demonstration, and finally to diagram the spot, sunspot's apparent paths at four moments of the year. Salviati further alleges that after Galileo had initially aired his hypothesis about the sunspot's strange changes, they undertook together the most meticulous of observations for many, many months, finding that the astronomer's predictions were fulfilled to the letter. Scholars' reactions to this narrative have varied, but not by much. Shortly after the publication of the dialogue, Galileo's disciple, Benedetto Castelli, confessed that he was beside himself with joy when he read that false testimony about the sunspots. And this festive skepticism characterized most commentary today, right up to John Heilbronn's amused allusion to that cock and bull story. Occasional defenders, such as Stillman Drake, have focused on Galileo's vagueness about which season corresponded with which sort of curve, while detractors have commented instead on the strong resemblance of the argument to the minute visual data offered by China in the Rosa Ursina, saying in sum that the strange changes of the spots was code for their appropriation. Most have emphasized the contrast between the importance of the discovery and Galileo's uncharacteristic reserve in announcing it. Several have noted problems with an epiphany that begins at Villa Le Salve a few years after the publication of the Letters on the Sunspots in March 1613 and concludes with many, many months of verification. For Salviati left Florence in late 1613, traveled to Spain, and died in Barcelona in the spring of 1614. Galileo planned to offer an elaborate uh, explanation of sunspots to a French vis visitor, Jean Tard, in December 1614, according to Tard's diary, saying that he would take him to a house in the country a few miles from Florence, 
where he kept all his instruments when the weather was bright and clear. This was surely Le Salve, but it seems safe to say that his late host would have been there in spirit only. Other textual peculiarities might be adduced. These do not compromise the principal issue of the sunspot's apparent annual path, but they do raise doubts about the inevitable claim of Galileo's primacy. Thus, for example, Salviati's imprecision about the year of this insight is complemented by his vacuous insistence on, quote, a stretch of bright and calm weather, unquote. Such circumstances would be a very likely precondition for a month's observation of a single spot, but they tell us nothing about which season saw the discovery of seasonal variation. The parenthetical remarks with which Sagredo concludes the discussion, quote, as what Signor Salviati is saying must be true, for it would be inappropriate to doubt his word, unquote, also contribute to the general tenor of amused mendacity. The oddest touch of all is Salviati's post-mortem patter. Awakened by such a lofty promise, I urged him to disclose his notion more clearly. But I'd like to turn away from this late text to reconstruct what if anything, Galileo thought about the possibility of a tilted solar axis in 1612. As is well known, the first suggestion that the path of the sunspots would provide evidence of a particular world system emerged in mid-February 1612 in an early reaction to Shiner's initial treatise. The anonymous Dutchman's brief discourse on the spots observed in the sun was written at the instigation of the scholar and statesman Cornelius van der Meel and dedicated to him. Rienk Vermeer has recently shown that the author was Willebrod Snell, Snellius. From November 1609 through March 1610, van der Meel had been the first ambassador the United Pri Provinces sent to the Venetian Republic. The intense interest in his mission and in the sovereignty of his country produced some, snob, some snubs from the, Venetia, from the French and Spanish diplomatic personnel, much gossip among the Venetians, and this painting. Um, there you see him, uh, Van der Meel, next to the Doge. Uh, Van der Meel had witnessed firsthand Venetian pride in Galileo's adaptation of the Dutch telescope. He departed just as the starry messenger was appearing. At least part of Snell's remit, therefore, was to reclaim for the Dutch natural philosophical ground lost first to Galileo and more recently to Shiner, then still identified by the pseudonym Apelles. The treatise opens with a reference to the importance of the Dutch telescope to foreign countries, and it gestures, without naming any protagonists, to the confident glances at Jupiter's thrones, at the many spots on the moon's surface, at the wandering and fixed stars. The sun alone has resisted, Snell adds, adding, quote, at last the road to this too has been opened up before you, unquote. Snell's tone often resembles, in a general way, that of Galileo. For instance, he refers with elaborate courtesy to the most erudite Apelles, even as he undermines many of his statements. He points out that Dutch sailors had long used colored lenses, just as, as Shiner did, to protect the eye. He voices brisk disappointment about Shiner's botched meditation on a planetary conjunction, saying, that little appendix on Venus seemed unnecessary to me. He shows that his addressee's three points about the movements of the spots can be reduced to a single sentence. But what is most crucial about the Dutchman's brief discourse is its concluding proposal. Snell suggests that in a Copernican world system, the location of a particularly resilient sunspot would appear to undergo a seasonal variation. And he writes, imagine the Earth turning in its annual orbit around the sun, which is the eye of the world because it is positioned at or near the center, and that the Earth moves in the direction of the zodiacal signs. When we hasten from the summer to the winter solstice, as the sun appears to decline, that conspicuous spot will likewise appear to move in the same direction from north to south. 
The contrary will happen when we progress from the winter to the summer solstice. Snell compared Shiner's solar images from the fall of 1611 with what he himself saw on the sun in late January or early February 1612. Having no notion of the tilted solar axis and observing nothing that matched his expectations, Snell acknowledged the failure of his conjecture, but he nonetheless concluded with a certain resistance to Shiner's cosmology, saying, if that perpetual spot does not move from its place, then it follows that the same face of the sun looks upon us and that the earth is at rest and on the contrary that the sun moves just as you now see it. But I foresee nothing of this sort. Of the foregoing, Galileo had no knowledge in early 1612 as his engagement with sunspots was then a matter sporadically pursued at dawn and at dusk. A sketch and a laconic scrawl suggest as much about what escaped notation as about what was duly depicted. And he writes, at sunset on February 17th, only one spot remained of those from sunrise. By early May, matters were otherwise. Galileo had just finished the first of his three letters to Apelles, and he had begun projecting sunspots into a dark room. At this point, uh, here he's doing squint and sketch. It is his second letter that interests me. Here, his initial gesture to the possibility of a tilted solar axis emerges. This letter was begun, like the series of sunspot observations that accompanies it, around June 2, 1612. Galileo did not sign off until August 14, 1612. Its most curious feature is the studied obliquity, to use the obvious term, with which the problem of an inclined solar axis is approached. In the midst of a protracted discussion involving the uh, conversion of actual sunspots shown in five images for early July to a diagram, an exercise designed to show their proximity to the sun's surface, Galileo suddenly adds, from the observations I have been able to make up until now, I do not judge that the revolution of the spots is oblique to the plane of the ecliptic in which the Earth lies. As he suppresses a subsequent reference to the position of the axis in the third letter and does not return to this parenthetical remark until the dialogue, I take this to be the slightest of gestures to a mostly notional research program. But the several deletions and additions that Galileo made between August 1612, when it was sent to Shiner, and December of that year, when he prepared it for publication, are also worth scrutiny, for they pertain to the same agenda. Recall that Salviati's anecdote, the cock and bull story, about Galileo's discovery moved from their examination of one large sunspot over the course of a month to the astronomer's sudden epiphany, and finally to a reference involving, quote, a simple sphere and using some of its circles, though not in the fashion for which they were ordinarily or are ordinarily deployed. Salviati went on to say that since he didn't have such an instrument at his disposal, he'd re rely on diagrams, an arrangement certainly much more convenient for the reader of the dialogue. But I'd like to return to this specter of this sphere in the second letter. In discarding the hypothesis that the spots were carried about by something other than the sun, Galileo had initially written that it was difficult, if not impossible, to imagine that a globe freely suspended and constrained by no obstacle can remain still in an ambient that whirls about it. A page later, he returned with greater specificity to this figure, writing and then again suppressing the suggestion that, quote, I see that a wooden globe, when placed in water which whirls around it, immediately participates in that same circular motion, even though wood has no inclination to such movement. Now clearly, this is not an appropriate model for a sun whose axis is fixed and tilted, though given that most globes were wooden balls to which paper gores had been glued, I can't think of a better image for a repurposed instrument. More to the point, the celebrated intervening passage describes in general terms the tendency of bodies to move with their ambient, 
and it culminates in the extraordinary image where, quote, a ship, having received one single time some impetus, would move continuously through a quiet sea around our globe without ever stopping. And if one were to gently bring it to rest, it would perpetually remain at rest, unquote. Reinserted into its original context, the sublime ship sailing or resting forever in some quiet sea can be prosaically or even criminally reduced to a globe maker sketch of a boat in the Pacific Ocean. What I'm suggesting here then is that Galileo deleted the implicit comparisons of the rotating sun to a wooden globe, not just because they were redundant, but also because a reader experimenting with such an instrument, however disinclined to plunge the costly thing into water, might well consider the possibility of a tilted solar axis. The much greater inclination of the Earth's axis would have made the seasonal variation of the sunspots all the easier to visualize. It's not surprising then to find that Galileo's other deletion occur occurring near the end of the second letter likewise involves a curious transfer of features of a terrestrial globe to the sun. In a grand gesture, Galileo states that future natural philosophers will be able to explain the rapid production and dissolution of vast vaporous masses, quote, some of which would far surpass in size Africa, Asia, and both Americas, unquote, and all of which fall in the same zone of the sun as that traversed by the planets. It's easy to imagine that he suppressed the ob this observation because of its speculative tone and the impressionistic reckoning of the sunspot's size. But it's easier still to suppose that any reader remotely interested in this assertion would compare the relative areas occupied by those continents on his globe to the largest of the sunspots in the images accompanying the second letter. To summarize then, Galileo struck these three passages in order to discourage any sustained association of the solar body with the one instrument readers were most likely to own, the terrestrial globe, whose axial tilt of 23 degrees they could not fail to notice. At the same time that he deleted these details, Galileo added others. These involved the sustained scrutiny of a large and dense sunspot. He notes quite reasonably that we must see some twice, for even if we fail to recognize them, any lifespan longer than one month would return them to us. He then confides, I have noticed more than once after the departure of some of the spots when the time of half of a revolution has passed, a spot begin to appear that was, in my opinion, the same one and moving along the same parallel. But he doesn't identify the long-lived spot. And though the second letter depicts several of monstrous size, such as R, which disappeared from view at the end of June, the series comes to an end on July 8th, too soon for that suggestion to be verified. Finally, it's far from clear that Galileo's hurried postscript was part of the original manuscript letter or that the three drawings pertinent to that text accompanied the missive. At some point, after concluding the letter on August 14, 1612, Galileo wrote, P.S. In conformity with what I had supposed and written, six days later, the effect followed. For the 19th, 20th, and 21st days of the present month, I and many other gentlemen friends of mine saw, with the naked eye, a dark spot near the middle of the solar disk at sunset, one of which was the largest among the many visible with the telescope. And I'm sending your lordship the drawings of this spot as well. This postscript does not appear at all in one of the two manuscripts sent to the printer. It is present in the other, but the closing reference to the drawings is absent. I'm unsure how to interpret this, but I want to note in passing that the printed version of these drawings is characterized by sloppiness, perhaps symptomatic of haste. The layout of text and image is poor. Machia Grande is not idiomatic. At least one copy has a typographic error in similmente, 
the hour indicated for the observations is not at sunset, but rather around 8 in the morning. To summarize the alterations made to the second letter between its initial manifestation as a missive for Shiner and its printed form, Galileo seems to have wanted to discourage experimentation with the globe and to have desired to convey the impression of his sustained observation of a large sunspot. My current hypothesis then is that he became interested in the question of a tilted solar axis, perhaps through a casual physical comparison of a terrestrial globe with the sun, and possibly even as a development of his description in the first letter about how the Earth would look to a very distant observer. There he says, the clouds on Earth would appear sometimes many, at other times few, sometimes expanding, and at other times shrinking. And if the Earth rotated on its axis, these, those clouds would also follow its motion. That he conceived of the apparent annual path of the sunspots as evidence for the Copernican world system at this point seems to me unlikely, but he must have recognized that he needed to verify the basic idea of that arcing path with painstaking projections of a large and long-lasting sunspot. The postscript story about the agreeable gentleman friends and their naked eye observations of a large spot in the middle of its passage across the solar surface, whether this took place in the morning or the evening, conveys an informality at odds with the documentary value of the images, which were clearly made through projection. But the more crucial point might be precisely this mis mismatch between willing collaborators and the desired data. In June and July 1612, Galileo sought out observers for even more projected uh, images of the sun turning to Lodovico Cigoli and Cosimino Cardi in Rome, to Daniele Antonini in Brussels and then in Udine, possibly to his student Galanzone Galanzoni in Avignon, and to Salviati in situ at Le Selve. Galileo alludes to the accuracy of Cigoli's and Antonini's images near the end of his second letter, but his subsequent private correspondence shows that he also asked them repeatedly to verify the exact length of the sunspot's trajectory and to undertake their projections at a particular hour, a request they could not always honor. The threat of rival claims might also have inspired him. Giambattista Agucchi, who, and that is him, uh, that's a great portrait of him, who absorbed sunspots, uh, observed sunspots every morning in Rome in July and August of 1612, and who was extremely interested in evidence for the sun's axial rotation, wrote to Galileo with an explicit comparison of the solar body to a terrestrial globe. Despite their difference in latitude, spots moving along what Aguki called the sun's equator, he noted, traversed it in the same interval as the tropics of, those, of that body. As he put it, their shape and motion could be represented by spinning a globe on which two such marks had been painted. Given that Aguki, closely associated with the church and the art world, had conferred a year earlier uh, with Galileo about an emblem of the Medici stars he'd been asked to design, this image had a potential public distinct from the letters on the sunspots. In October 1612, and, and perhaps before, Galileo received a copy of the Dutchman's brief discourse from a friend in Rome. It, it seems to me, uh, we know he got it then, uh, but Van der Meel had the Dutchman's brief, Snell's treatise, sent out to a lot of places, and he was very friendly with people in Venice. So it seems to me possible that Galileo had gotten the thing before. Uh, but he left, in any case, he left no reaction to it. In July 1613, he heard via another friend in Rome that astronomers in Paris, following Snell's suggestion, had been investigating the seasonal variations of the sunspots for over a year. But here, too, he seems to have declined the offer of collaborative investigation. In August 1613, he was contacted from Antwerp by Ottavio Pisani, who was projecting sunspots and who mentioned both Shiner's work and the Dutchman's brief discourse. In a publication of that same year, uh, which Pisani sent to Galileo, Pisani made explicit in the midst of his careful reconstruction of planetary motions that he could not account for the sunspots' path. 
Though he offered nothing so explicit as Pisani's nulla theorica apparentia, Galileo was hampered by two largely unforeseen developments. Three of his observers died unexpectedly. Cigoli perished in Rome in June 1613, Salviati in Barcelona in March 1614, Antonini in battle in the Friuli two years after that. Galileo sought out at least two more collaborators, Fabio Colonna in August 1613, and Giambattista Baliani in March 1614 with very detailed instructions of what they were meant to do. But here he confronted the sudden drop in sunspots for most of the rest of the decade. Galileo's few allusions to sunspots in the early to mid 1620s are sparse and less than resolute. In the assayer of 1623, for instance, he stated that he had never explicitly argued for the movement of the solar globe rather than that of the ambient, and that he did not know which took place. By 1628, his confederates were assuring him that Shiner's work was on the verge of appearing, and that another enemy, Scipione Chiaramonti, was casting about, quote, for sunspot observations so distorted that they might be accommodated to his idiotic opinions." Unquote. Um, the letters of Galileo's close confederate Benedetto Castelli provide the best index of what I assumed was, uh, I assume was that abandoned research agenda. In Feb late February 1629, Castelli wrote that Shiner's book was at last coming off the press and in the next sentence, that a large, dense, round, and isolated sunspot was making its second circuit of the sun. 18 months later, Castelli wrote that a vast sunspot composed of some 58 smaller spots, its length exceeding a third of the sun's diameter, had lately uh, appeared. Now, given Galileo's advanced age and Castelli's desire to see the dialogue into print, it seems to me that these were not hectoring efforts to get the laggardly astronomer to undertake new solar observations, but more likely gestures to the narrative setting for a speculative conjecture about the sunspot's seasonal, seasonal variation. But once Galileo saw Shiner's data and, worse still, his bold bid for priority, the conjecture backdated and enriched with bogus historical details became what Castelli would later recognize as that false testimony. Let me return by way of conclusion to the puzzling image at Le Selve. A sheet lies discarded in the foreground, its lower edge decorated with what might be the monstrously large sunspot R on June 24, 1612, or maybe another ink blot. A related image, an early 18th century English copy of a portrait by Sustermans has the same set of props, chair, globe, telescope. Its owners, the British Optical Association, claim that the spine of one of the books identifies it as Thomas Salisbury's Life of Galileo, published in 1664 and lost, save for one copy, in the Great Fire of London. If true, and who am I to question what the British Optical Association sees in their painting, their sitter's a specter. Our Italian painting achieves a similar effect, surely by accident. In this portrait that may or may not depict Galileo thinking about sunspots some summer at Le Selve, the astronomer's right leg, semi-transparent, makes him seem at once present and absent. Thank you. Well, he saw, he recognized before Shiner that they were faculi as well as maculi. He never, I, Galileo, I mean, he, he sustained that uh, analogy with the Earth's clouds if, for as long as he could, which makes me, that seems to me that if you were asking about how the Earth would look from space, you would ask, well, then the clouds are they, is their trajectory, does it follow the same inclination of the Earth's axis? And it seems to me that you extrapolate from that model that he puts out there in the first letter. But 
he doesn't, Galileo, for a variety of reasons, doesn't really want to say what he thinks the sunspots are because I suppose in part to discourage a bit of this analogy um, because it implies a, a, the, a question of the tilted uh, solar axis, but also in part because I, I don't think that he says, um, he, he doesn't know, like if the sun is burning stuff up, you know, how does, it, how does it, what's its fuel source? I mean, he says somewhere that he, that he wants to back off from that uh, analogy um, because it's troubling. And then he, and he does something very clever. He says, uh, just because it's close by doesn't mean that we know it any better. And so he talks about how, uh, you know, if I, I, I'm told that this is clouds and these are composed of water, what is finally water? I, I mean, in other words, just the proximity and the abundance will be no index of its uh, availability to us. And so I should be able to speculate about stuff that's far away, um, uh, but not really on its essence. All I'm doing is plotting its movement, its relative size, uh, et cetera. So I, I, I have never seen him say too much about its physical, uh, you know, what they were. I mean, he just analogizes, but it always will say, um, this is only an analogy to make it, uh, uh, you know, more palatable. But here's a great thing. I saw this, I, I thought about this the other day because I was teaching the story messenger for someone. And you know how there's that, that point in the story messenger where Galileo says, um, the earth is not, he says, we will demonstrate in our dialogue, I think he says, um, with many arguments and demonstrations that the earth is not the cesspool of the universe, et cetera, et cetera. And he has this kind of alarming language. It's not the, the you know, it doesn't contain all the filth of the universe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and that's a standard thing, phaix caele, feces of the heavens, was this, this old name for the earth, that everything flowed down there, and it was this kind of, I don't know, latrine at the center of the universe. But it seems to me that if you believe that story that he knew pretty early on about the sunspots prior to his move to Florence, logically, if, you, if you're going to say there's something at the center and there's some stuff on it, it would be the sun. I mean, I, in other words, I looked at that remark as kind of gesturing to something he's going to do in the future, and it's a way of saying that the Earth is bright and it's a, it's a planetary, planetary this and that and the other. But it also seemed to me latent um, as a description of the sun, uh, something to which uh, some filth, uh, you know, planetary, I don't know, the detritus, the detritus of the cosmos has, has moved. Just to uh, post hoc say, the question was, did Galileo have a view, for the camera, did Galileo have a view about the nature of sunspots and not their behavior, but what they were ultimately? The yeah. So could you repeat the next question before? Just if I can hear it. I'm okay. very hard of hearing, but yes. Sarah? Hi. Um, well, this relates to the last one. And what I found fascinating in your talk is more evidence of Galileo still you know, moving away from an Aristotelian matter theory, which comes up with, you know, that things are point, you know, their nature is to come down to the earth and uh, what are the nature of the heavenly bodies. And his new physics, which is also moving to this kind of circular inertia as well. So in your um, comparison of what, you know, his statements about uh, a wooden globe, whether it's in an armor sphere or a terrestrial globe, it's saying, you know, in water, it's not its nature to spin, but the water around it is going to carry it. And um, so it seems that his view on these sunspots and these analogies is still partly Aristotelian, partly working out the physics of this moving stuff. And it's not completely clear, you know, in his, you know, his 
does uh, hold on to sort of older parts of the theory, but it seemed to me that much of the letters on, of the sunspots, particularly that second letter, is about transferring very specific visual experiences, so those projected sunspots, into uh, a kind of a low-level geometry in order to show uh, that, they're, that they can be no other place than very close to the surface. So it's very tedious when one is reading it to constantly looking at a particular day where he identifies a spot, he's not going to tell you what it is, and then transfer it to this geometrical drawing and arc this and sign this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that as a corollary to that, that the quickest way to visualize what a slight axial inclination would do to the pass would be if you, I mean, you see it very quickly if you take a, a terrestrial globe. You can explain it very easily. And he would have needed, so it's another question of translating images without um, grounding them in specific essences to a kind of visualization of motion. Um, and since I don't think he wanted to be scooped on that, I think that's why he uh, kept backing away from anything that would have you take your own globe and try to say, okay, here's how the spots would work uh, if, I, if I'm going to call this the sun. He also must have needed something. He knows that it can't be a huge tilt, say, of 23 degrees. Um, but it has to be big enough to be noticeable. He probably didn't want anything that would compromise his lovely calculations and images. So, you know, seven degrees was good. But yes, he wanted, he wanted I think, this kind of, uh, a, a, a kind of very satisfactory feeling that one gets when reading it, like, okay, I can visualize this, um, but without um, buying too much into particular essences about bodies that they behave this way or that. So the globe is a geometrical model yes. as opposed to a physical yes. You know, yes. material. Yes, and that's why I think that it seemed to me that that little addendum, which he later abstracted, but he says, you know, so okay, uh, a wooden globe if uh, hurled into the water and about how it's spinning and all that, he says, even though wood itself, it, but the, you know, if, the th if it floats or whatever, that's important, but it, it's kind of misleading to say wood doesn't have any inclination to spinning. That's not really, you know, that, that, that seems to me a decoy. And then in the end, he just, he took out those globe remarks and left us with that isolated passage about the ship sailing forever, blah, blah, blah. It must be time for coffee and treats. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Uh, if not, let's adjourn, thank Eileen, and then adjourn to coffee for a brief break. <laughs> Thank you.